I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Sharon Noble. She's the director of the BC Coalition to Stop Smart Meters. Welcome back to the show, Sharon. Thank you very much, Jim. One of the latest findings has been that perhaps RF radiation can cause tumors of the heart and the brain. You have tried to inform the B.C. government about that. Can you tell us about your efforts? I sure did. I spoke about this study when we last spoke, I think, Jim. It was from the National Toxicology Program in the U.S., a 25 million 10-year study. And the the preliminary findings were released more quickly than anticipated because the scientists thought they were so very important. They confirmed that exposure to cell phones and radi- wireless radiation leads to and contributes to increased uh, brain t- cancers, especially glioblastomas. And something that was really surprising to them were tumors of the heart called schwannomas. It's in the lining of the heart. And this is something that used to be fairly rare but is now becoming more common. There will be more findings, as they said, Uh, coming out later in the year, but they wanted to get this initial warning out there because they think it's time that we start employing the precautionary principle and informing people that this is a danger. Stay away from wireless cell phones and anything else that's wireless. And for the first time that I've ever seen, the American Cancer Society spoke out. Until now, they, like the BC Cancer Society and the Canadian Cancer Society, have sided with the industry. They get you know, support from the industry in funding, quote, for research, and they are very hesitant to say anything that would jeopardize that funding. But the American Cancer Society released a press release saying that this is excellent science that is a game changer and that things need to um, happen to start looking at a precautionary approach. So I sent this on June 8th. I wrote a letter to Terry Lake, our Minister of Health, copied, of course, Perry Kendall, and the uh, Deputy Ministers of Health, telling them about the study, giving them access to it, telling them what the American Cancer Society had said, and warning them that our children especially are vulnerable to this because parents don't know they're giving them cell phones to sit in their high chairs and on their training potties to, uh, to... keep themselves uh, busy. They're being given cell phones and laptops and these iPads for schoolwork. Our children are especially vulnerable, and I have yet to even receive an acknowledgement. But this is typical for the people in our government. It's typical for Perry Kendall to turn a blind eye and to pretend it doesn't matter and to pretend that he he is the expert. So many times Perry Kendall has said, that he has decided that these things are okay, that children don't have to worry, that there's no evidence of harm. How much but, research has Perry Kendall done into this? Perry Kendall, by the way, is the province's chief health officer. officer. Yes, chief he medical is a health public officer. Health doctor. Yes, he's taken all of his studies, all of his work, all of his professional career has been in public health, and public health means these are doctors who are trained to prevent things from happening. They're not trained in research. He's never done research in this area. What they're supposed to do is, for instance, if there's smoke in the air, you alert the people to close your windows. Don't go outside because you could get, your asthma could get worse. You have people checking water to see if it's drinkable or if there's some pollutants in it. This is what they do. They don't do research and they don't heal people. Public health doctors have very important roles of alerting to the public of potential problems. And Perry Kendall's job 
is to alert the public that there are potential problems in schools from Wi-Fi, in our homes from smart meters, outside from cell towers, from cell phones, and he refuses to do it. He absolutely refuses to do it. The man is shameful, and he should not have this job. It's too important. We need someone in that position who actually understands the precautionary principle. Perry Kendall told me in person at a meeting when I gave him some information, and I said, why aren't you employing the precautionary principle? And he said, and I have witnesses, when there is proof, I will employ the precautionary principle. No, the precautionary principle, if anyone looks it up, is what you do when there is significant evidence of harm, but it falls short of proof. You take precautionary action when you think that there is likelihood that somebody could get hurt. If there's proof, the things would be banned. We don't have irrefutable proof yet. And Perry Kendall just doesn't understand the precautionary principle. Were those registered letters that you sent warning of the RF tumor dangers? No. Nope. I gave up on registered letters long ago. I spent money. Registered letters cost $10 each. I've spent so much money spending regist sending registered letters to Bill Bennett, to Christy Clark, to Perry Kendall, to Horgan, whatever. I never get a response. So, no, nope, these are re just regular letters and emails. The fact is, they don't care enough to respond. That's my feeling. These people have believe that this is not an important issue. And it's a vital issue. As many of the, our scientists, like Dar Dr. Martin Blank, who lives here in Victoria now, he taught at the U uh, Columbia University and did his research there. He now lives in Van Victoria. He says this is a uh, catastrophe waiting to happen. He believes it is worse than any other health issue that has come up, worse than smoking, worse than lead, because everyone is being exposed to it. And our children are being exposed to it from the, before they're even born, from the time they're conceived. This is, as others have said, this is a tsunami, and the wall is yet to hit us. It's coming, and when it does, our health system is going to suffer. We won't be able to pay for all the costs. And we'll, we will have people suffering lifelong illnesses and health problems that could have been prevented. Could these officials be sued? I believe so. I, nothing has happened yet to confirm my, my position. I'm not a lawyer. But when you give somebody, such as Perry Kendall, or a school principal, or a school trustee, evidence that, for instance, Wi-Fi in school is dangerous, and they personally choose to ignore it, I believe that they could be charged with harmful negligence or willful blindness. The thing is, all of them believe that they are immune to this. I've heard school trustees say that they are protected by their director's insurance. They cannot be sued. They should read their insurance policy. The insurance says that they cannot be sued so long as they are acting in good faith. Good faith means that you're doing your job, that you are look, taking precautionary actions, you are doing what is necessary to protect, for instance, children in your charge. If school trustees have been given evidence that Wi-Fi in school is dangerous and they ignore it, I b believe that they could be sued individually. And I think it's coming to the point where this is going to start happening because people are becoming more educated, they're becoming more aware of the dangers, and more people are becoming seriously affected by this. It's just a matter of time. Do schools have an alternative to using Wi-Fi for children's computers? Of course they do. Most are already wired with fiber optic cables to computer rooms, etc. This connection is faster, safer, more secure, it's harder to be hacked, and it doesn't irradiate. And this could be extended and probably has been extended to school rooms. They could have outlets where kids could plug in to a wired computer access. They can download the information 
and then put their laptops or whatever on airplane mode and work from their desks just as they're working now. The only thing is that they would download the information from a wired access. This is what many schools in Europe are doing now. For instance, Swisscom in Switzerland about 10 years ago. It is the major Wi-Fi provider in Switzerland and it applied for a patent for a new type of Wi-Fi modem. And in that patent it said, you know, given the new scientific evidence, they have to admit and acknowledge that their modems are dangerous, that Wi-Fi from wireless rate, uh, modems are very is very dangerous. And so they asked for a new type of modem, and I don't know the details, I'm not a technical expert, but Swisscom voluntarily removed all the Wi-Fi from schools that they had put in. We don't have responsible companies like that here in British Columbia or in Canada. They are out for money and they really will try to deceive and mislead people into thinking that Wi-Fi either doesn't exist or that it's completely harm harmless. And it's just not true. We see evidence of that over and over. You can look at Perry Kendall's website. You can look at the BC Cancer Society's website. You can look at most schools' websites. And they will say, there is no credible evidence that this radiation is harmful. That is just a blatant lie. There are thousands of studies showing that this radiation is dangerous. And why they're doing it, I don't understand. Just as I don't understand why we're being forced to put fire hazards on our house when we have to put smart meters that not only irradiate but threaten us with burning our house, house down. I just don't understand it, Jim. Well, I know we had technology in the 70s where we had wireless infrared headphones at the radio station I worked at in Winnipeg. So it's not like there aren't alternatives to using Wi-Fi. And it's, it, there are more um, technology, technological advances occurring all the time. There's a new one that's just being tested now. It's called Li-Fi, where they're using fiber optic cables to an outlet, and from there, light is coming. And it's uh, showing on your pad like a modem, and you're working with light instead of radiation. This is being tested to make sure that there's nothing else. They don't want to make the same mistake that they did with Wi-Fi, because colors, for instance, if you look at your, your computer modem, you know, late at night, it's going to affect your melatonin production. Your pineal gland is affected by certain colors. I, I believe it's the blue light that affects your melatonin production. And if your melatonin isn't being produced properly, you don't sleep well. You don't get that deep recuperative sleep. And so you can put a red screen. You can go and download a red screen that comes on at sunset. And this will help you so that you can sleep well. So they're trying to make sure that there's nothing like that with this Wi-Fi. But there's new technology that can replace this old technology. Wireless is is the cheapest. It's the easiest, and that's why the companies are, are using it. That's why TELUS is using it. We'll have more with Sharon Noble right after the break. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. In Goddard, we trust. Welcome back. We're speaking with Sharon Noble. Sharon, you say there's a new tsunami of hydro cutoffs in BC. Can you explain what's happening there? Yes, this was um, in the Taiyi earlier, um, a few days ago. Hydro, as you know, one of the benefits of their smart meter program is they touted uh, to the BC Utilities Commission and everyone else who would listen is that they can remotely disconnect your power and they said this so benignly that they can they don't have to send anyone out to your house anymore when you move or when you haven't paid your bill and there was a, in the Taiyi article is that historically 
there had been between four and 5,000 disconnections a year. But in the last two years, in 2000, from 2013 to 2015, they were in excess of 30,000 disconnections. 38,781 in 2015, 32,564 in 2013, and it's going to exceed 37,000 this year. And these are people who are having to choose, in most cases, between food and heat. They don't have the money to pay their bill. And until just recently, Hydro was charging $125 to get your power back on. So in the two, in 2013, 2014, and 2015, each year they earned well in excess of $4 million in a, a, additional fees from the people who can least afford it. This is so draconian. This is like something that you would read you know, happening centuries ago. Here are people who can't pay their bills because the rates are going up so tremendously. They've got smart meters. They're charging them for every ounce of consumption. And sometimes the smart meters are not accurate. But these people can't fight it. They're the most vulnerable. And these people are paying $125. Even if they were disconnected at 8 in the morning and are reconnected, they pay their bill by 10 in the morning, they're paying a $125 reconnection fee. Does it, cost hy- does it cost Hydro 125 bucks to turn the power back on? It's a switch. The smart meter allows them to turn it off and on with a switch. Nobody's going to their home anymore. In fact, one of the installers said, you know, that they didn't turn power off in the winter because they didn't like going out to homes and doing that when it was so cold. But now there's no face-to-face. You're not putting a name and a face together. You can just see, well, they missed paying their bill today. Okay, switch. Nope. Now the rates, the charge, the reconnection fee is down to $30, which is still extortion and exorbitantly high for throwing a switch. But before, until just recently, $125 for throwing a switch. Do they know if the person that they're turning the power off of is disabled or an elderly person, very vulnerable to the cold, or if they have very young children? Or if they have medical devices? Yes. Nope. How do They have no idea. They have no idea who they're turning it off for. The person who's rolling the switch just knows that the bill hasn't been paid. Where can you get a wipe or a RF meter and how much do they cost? You can get really inexpensive ones. By inexpensive, I mean in the range of $100. If you go online to Safe Living Technology, for instance, uh, Google Safe Living Technology. He's in, I think it's Kitchener, Ontario. Um, he has a whole range of them. He can suggest some other ones too. His name is Rob Metzinger, who owns the company. And he's very, very knowledgeable. I don't know him very well, but this is where I buy my, where we've bought our equipment. Um, the very best meter I ever bought is no longer available, and I love the little thing. It looks like something from a Space Odyssey movie. It looks like a little spaceship. It doesn't have any meters. It doesn't have any gauges or anything, but it makes one heck of a lot of noise. And it will tell you. It will beep one way if it's Wi-Fi. It beeps another way if it's a um, cell tower. It's really quite amazing. But there are other ones called acoustometers. There are tri-field meters. But I would strongly suggest talking to someone like Rob Metzinger at Safe Living Technology. I think his website, and this is from memory, so you'll have to check it, is sl, slt.co in Kitchener, Ontario. He sells all sorts of shielding, and he sells meters. And if you tell him the price range you have and the kind of thing that you want to measure because there are ones that are devoted, for instance, to different frequencies. You don't want that. If you're buying a cheap meter, you want something that will cover as wide a range of frequencies as possible because you don't need to know if it's 900 megahertz or or 1.2 gigahertz. You don't need to know that. You just need to know that there's uh, something wireless in your area. Someone um, from... Oh, gosh, where is he from? In the Okanagan somewhere. Called me this morning. 
he had moved from Vancouver because his, his wife is very, very sensitive. And they bought a home with several acres around them. They don't, they own part of the land, but the other people who live there don't want any wireless either, so they felt that they were pretty safe. And he said about two weeks ago, she started feeling very, very sick. And he got his meter out and discovered that there's a new something, a new source around, and he can't find it. But he believes it's probably either Shaw or Telus's open way or gateway transmitters um, that they are putting along streets. We're finding that the same in our area. There are some new, really high emitters somewhere, and I haven't been able to locate them yet. But um, things are getting pretty bad out here. Sharon, anything else you wanted to add today? Oh, yes, 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 there is. Hydro um, as, is collecting $20 a month from those people who had analogs on December 2013 and who qualify for their special opt-out provision. The only opt-out is to take a smart meter with the transmitter turned off. We don't have a lot of uh, feedback from people with this problem, but there have been a few who are paying this $20 and have found that their transmitter is not turned off. It is emitting. So if people want to find out, they could email me, tell me where they live, what community, and I'll see if I can find someone in their community who has an RF meter. This is a type of situation where if you even have an inexpensive RF meter, you could check to see if your, your smart meter is sending out some sort of junk. But it is happening. So I thought people need to know that there's a possibility that their smart meter is not turned off, even if they think it is. Sharon, thank you very much for chatting with us. My pleasure as always, Jim. Thank you. My guest has been Sharon Noble, Director of the Coalition to Stop Smart Meters in B.C. What are your websites, Sharon? www.stopsmartmetersbc.com and www.citizensforsafetechnology.org. Sharon, thanks again. My pleasure. You're listening to The Goddard Report on TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our popular YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Questions for the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Thanks for listening. Comments made on The Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.